this is, this is, this is. Well, thanks for having me back. I, I appreciate it greatly. Yeah, man. Thanks for doing it. I appreciate it. You know, uh, it's been a minute. A lot has changed in the world, <laughs> <laughs> including today. I mean, wake up today, Roe Ro v. Wade. This is coming out Monday, but I mean, that's pretty soon from now, so I don't think it'll be out of date yet. Roe v. Wade uh, repealed, and it's just like, uh, I mean, you knew it was going to happen, but. I didn't believe it until I read it, though. I have to say, I, I really did not believe it until I saw it on Washington Post. There's a lot mid, of fake news out there. You, you never can. <laughs> well, not with the Post. Come on, Mike. No. Um, but with the when, when I saw it, it was almost I was stunned. It got, I, I, I agree with you. I knew it was coming. But it, it kind of melted me into the chair when I read it. Yeah, it's and, weird. It's a weird yeah. situation. I mean, uh I don't get really political on my social media, but but here on the podcast, I might as well say like, it, it just it doesn't make sense to me. Because um, if you don't want an abortion, don't get an abortion. You know, it's like <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, I I just don't get it. But um, I just I'm the always... health implication, the health implications alone. Yeah. Um, regardless of how people feel about it for their personal thing, if just but just for for the health and safety of of women I mean, these are and and the thing that I really grinds my gears about it is that like these are our sisters and our wives and our mothers and grandmother I mean these are people who are pillars in our life who have had to face these decisions and and it's hard enough having I imagine having you know as a male I've never been pregnant um I hope to never be pregnant as a male. That would be a whole other uh, different <laughs> podcast be a surprise. discussion. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, but I, you know, I, I I can't imagine what's what's going through the mind of, of a woman who's who's faced with that. Let alone being in a place that is now uh, that much more dangerous, unlawful, and unhelpful and unsafe uh, to yeah. to provide safe access to to abortions. Um, yeah, that's that's what they uh, say. Is like it's not that this is going to stop people from getting or seeking an, an abortion. It's just going to make it harder and da more dangerous, obviously more expensive. So rich people are going to be fine. But if yeah. you're poor, geez, you know, I can't imagine just, I was thinking about this today. I was like, I've been mowing my lawn a lot and it's a good thing I own a lawnmower mm -hmm. because if I couldn't afford a lawnmower, my, my yard would look like, worse than it already is <laughs> it looked like crap you know but it, i mean it, just everything you can just branch out into life it's just the the less money you have the less access to s solutions for your life that there, yeah there are yeah i mean and i just you know along the same lines i hope that the and i i really dislike doing this because i don't think it adds to the positive tenor of any sort of conversation but it's just the reality that we we live in places where there are states like California, for example, that are more progressive and more liberal, and hopefully, uh, in light of this, can step up their safety measures and their access and their outreach, and hopefully there will be a, a growing web of community, much like there is with DIY and punk rock and hardcore, where you know we can look out for each other and look out for the women in our lives that need safe access to abortions in terms of getting them on trains or buses or airplanes to these safe haven states uh, where they can access abortions and, and hopefully do it on the dimes of of other people and and people who are making donations and you know it's it's not ideal no it's sad I'm just thinking but, how weird this all is is just like it's so weird that that we're trying to like normalize um having to rely on random strangers for you know and it's it shouldn't be that way really i mean healthcare should be better in this country for how how good of a country this is it's an amazing country there's there's so many freedoms we enjoy as americans you know and the healthcare thing is just it's not really helpful it really isn't you're not really encouraged to ask questions when i grew up it doesn't it wasn't like that 
I didn't think, you know, I didn't come from a rich or super poor family. I was kind of middle class. My dad was mm -hmm. in the, the military. So we were kind of covered. You know, he was he was in the Navy and <clears throat> hence Bremerton, hence right? Bremerton. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. but so I feel like I, you know, I grew up a pretty normal average American childhood, you know, went to church you know, did all the things you're supposed to do, did some things I wasn't supposed to do as well, but you're kind of <laughs> supposed to do those as well, you know, got yeah. drunk at an elementary school for the first time. <laughs> it, it, wasn't breaks my, in class. Yeah. it breaks my heart though. When I see people, I mean, it happens in, in every walk of life, but yeah, you and I primarily pay attention to our colleagues in the music world who put up GoFundMes to cover health expenses and, and all that stuff. And it's, it's just, heartbreaking like these you see these people that were like punk rock heroes to me that are doing this and you're like man you should not have to be depending on the donations of people like me in order to cover the expenses that you and your family have incurred so that you don't die from cancer you know it doesn't need to be like that but the fact that, that it is 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 you know it's the duality of it it's it warms the heart that, that we're from a community that wants to look out for each other but it also breaks my heart that people are put in that predicament in the first place you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure i mean with roe v wade you know it was something that's been it's always been there as far as i've known and it's never been really uh, it's been a political hot button issue for for decades of course it still is but to me it was never something that like really bothered anybody you know it was uh there were still states where you couldn't get abortion. So I was like, why is it, what's, what's really the difference here, you know? Oh, uh, see, I, I come at it from a completely different, uh, at a young age, it was something that I picked up on as being a dividing issue. Mm. And on top of that, being an issue that drove people to make the decision that they made in the voting booth, more so than any other decision. So, you know, growing up in, in the, you know, obviously I don't really remember much of, certainly much politically of, of the Reagan era. I, I think you're a few years older than me, not to, to date you, but <laughs> you're a few, you know, I, I just turned 40. So I have recollections of even as far back as Bush 41, you know, which was 88 to 92. And then with, with Clinton and obviously with George W. Bush and, and so on, it's, there were people that I knew in my small town in Pennsylvania whose parents were seemingly kind of liberal and pro progressive, but not when it came to the issue of abortion. And I think that what's happening now is kind of a, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like the, the microscope, you know, with the sunlight and that's killing the, the ants or whatever. It's kind of like really, really burning into the issue because there was a, a case, this Dobbs case, right, that made it all the way through the appeals court system to the Supreme Court. And I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who stand up for liberal causes and progressive causes except for abortion. And then on top of that, there's, you know, religious zealots and, and uh, the conservative Christian uh, sects of the population that have always been promoting this – really unkind version of what they call quote unquote pro-life. But I, I think as a, as a, you said, as a hot button issue, it's interesting that the perception of it being a hot button issue, I think kind of flares up in different parts of the country more so than others, but also it reflects on us as men. I think it has to, that inherently like there's a privilege that you and I don't have to think about this on the same uh, visceral, uh, almost like DNA level that, that women do. And so I've noticed it in the past, like few years when I've been, especially since Trump, you know, it's like, I I've noticed my privilege as a straight white male and the things that, uh, I'm more prone to, or the safety and, and the comforts that I get to experience because of, you know, just how I am and how I choose to live my life. And it's made me want to be that much more of an ally for people who are not the same gender as me or don't uh, associate or identify as the same gender as me or don't uh, have the same access to uh, health care. And, and I include abortion in health care in that regard. 
So it's like a, a I, I just want to be an ally. I, I want to help people live as, as free as they can. And I think that there's a lot of people who might feel the same way about a lot of political or socioeconomic issues as I do. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to abortion, they don't. And a lot of times that might be what's, you know, being there. That's like the issue that they vote on when they're in the voting booth. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That was something I picked up on at an early age. Mm. I Yeah, that's – I think for me it's not so much about the actual issue of abortion. It's, it's about everything. It's about common sense and – I don't like being told what to do. Um, and because just because it might be better for somebody to do A, it might not be better for me to do A. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more prone to B. So with that in mind, I live my life kind of trying to like step back and not be like so judgmental about everything. Even though I'm very judgmental, it's, you know, we all can be. <laughs> but I try not to put it out there. I, I keep it and try to really think about what it, what it is I think and why. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times I'll, my, you know, I'll, ch I'll change my mind or I'll, I'll soften on an idea, but going back to Roe v. Wade and things like that, I don't want a bunch of people that were, you know, chosen by politicians to be deciding for women what's best for them, for their lives. And, and in mm -hmm. the same way, I feel like drugs should be legal and, um, you know, we could go further. Guns should probably not be illegal, but should be harder to get. Things like that. Let's make common sense laws that help a lot of people, but, but don't go all the way one way or all the way the other way. So I'm people that listen to this podcast probably know I'm somewhat in the center of, of things. Like I think conservatively on th some ideas and I think, very liberally on, on a lot of ideas, definitely socially. Um, yeah. But I think people can be ridiculous, even with their wokeness and with their whatever it is that they're trying to do. So, but I, I don't want to judge because it's like, hey, if they're happy, then they're happy. Just don't fuck with me, you know. And 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 that's where I draw the line. It's like my neighbor. I'm like, kind of in an uproar right here. The the studio neighbor. Um, Last year, my basement started flooding. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, why is it flooding? It's summertime. And I'm just cleaning it up, figuring it out. And I come in the next day, and my driveway is flooded. I'm like, what? Burst pipe, I'm thinking, right? And I call, I call uh, Rick, my studio partner guy helps me out over here, help build a studio. Um, I'm like, I think we might need a plumber. <laughs> he goes, it's never good to need a plumber. Right. He's like, look around more, like look around and see where the water could be coming from. If it's not a burst pipe, it could be from somewhere else. So I start looking around. Sure enough, my neighbor left his hose on for days, weeks, who knows how long. A water, a garden hose is just going, going going and so I went over and I turned it off and he's nowhere around so I didn't talk to him and I still haven't talked to him so the reason what? why I was all the reason why I was all in a in a hizzy earlier was I saw a hose go over the fence and I'm like is he gonna put the hose on again I'm gonna go talk to him right now but I couldn't because my daughter came over my daughter I brought my daughter over to the studio earlier this morning uh, to do a little session. And so I was like, I can't do it right now with her here. I'm just like, I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> but, but, you know, I don't mind whatever my neighbor does. Just don't leave your faucet on that gets the water in my basement, you know? And, right. and I think every, most people hearing that would go, yeah, that seems reasonable. Even my neighbor, when hearing that, would pr I hope would go, I'm so sorry. And I'm not going to sue him. I'm not going to, you know, whatever. It, it happened. He didn't do it on purpose. Now, if he did it on purpose, what should I do? You know? Right. That's a different story. Do I story. let that go? Do I? <laughs> no. You no. don't. I, I'm with you. Like, you know, they talk about like, these quote unquote common sense gun laws, but specifically with, with gun laws, I don't think a lot of those are um, all that sensical. 
considering the problem that we have. And I think where things get tied up is that like wokeness right now is like an enemy, right? Or like liberalism or libs or, you know, I, I'm called a snowflake or a oh, no faggot libs. or whatever. Like it's just, it's so sick. But people equate like things that are predicated on inclusion and safety and helpfulness, like laws that promote common sense and safety and, and guidelines for health, like they view that as like, you know, the overarching left and, and they view that as like a, a, a tread on them, you know, whereas they're supporting politicians who are actively taking away uh, reproductive rights of women, actively taking away uh, voting and voting registration uh, protection and rights for people of every class, creed, religion, and socioeconomic status. And so it's it's almost as if like the wires are crossed where cult the culture war is that somebody like myself is pitted against, you know, my my political polar opposite. When in reality, we, we kind of want the same, uh, more or less the same things and the same freedoms. But the perception is that I'm looking at it from an inclusive perspective way and like how can i bring more people to the table and generally speaking they're looking at it from a more exclusive way and even if they're not actively promoting it like that it gets really easy with with punk and hardcore i think it's easy because to me punk is predicated on having some silly haircuts and and helping people who look uh who look helping people who uh are are not as fortunate as you to to look out for people in the community that are 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 poor or are elderly or are um, uh, disabled or, um, you know, anything like that, es especially when it comes to like the web of the punk scene or whatever, but right. That's kind think... of a newer thing, right. In punk, like, cause punk, when it started out was, I guess maybe the clash brought that in, but you know, when punk was all about rebelling against the system and now punk is about, uh, community. the opposite and <laughs> the community yeah. and, and inclusiveness and yeah. accepting people for who they are being positive. That's right. not a bad thing, but I no. think the, the lack of asking and questioning authority is a bad thing. And, and that's where I draw the line of where I feel like there, there's, there's a contingency where it's it, people not, aren't necessarily thinking about this the way I'm thinking about it as well. So I get it, but but just going along with whatever you're told, um, branding, companies, propaganda, government, all of this stuff, like, is constantly coming in at us, and and, and I get I get propagandized. I don't know if that's a word, but I think it might be uh, all the time. Where I realize, oh yeah, I'm re I'm really into this, and it's because, oh yeah, I've been watching this show for a long time, you know, or whatever, you know, like I'm into basketball right now. I watch the you know, the NBA final, you know, the playoffs mm -hmm. and the finals. And it, and I had never really done that before. And now I'm a basketball fan. So it's so easy to, I don't know, get sucked into things, right? You know, and, and obviously I think basketball is not a, <laughs> it's not a negative, that's a positive, but, but uh, there's a lot of negative things you can easily get, get sucked into. And I, and I think any extreme as somebody that's trying to, just look at the world in a in a in a um i don't know uh, almost like a case by case like case, I, I, yeah yeah you know, case I, by I case can... basis i try not yeah i try not to just put a big big umbrella over one thing you know yeah that's what a racist would do that's what a any anybody that's any extremist mind. would do yeah yeah and, and, and i think i think what you're describing would often be fairly or not kind of categorized in terms of the vernacular of our modern culture as moderate, right? Right, right, but, moderate, sure. But, but moderate has political implications that some people are okay with and some people are, you know, just I don't think forever that, of, yeah. offended by, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. it, when it comes to the actual labeling of it, it's it's a little bit difficult because then you, people get into disagreements about, you know, yeah. well, what is what is a liberal or are you a progressive yeah. if you also, you know, don't believe X, Y and Z or you don't, yeah. you know, fight for the, the whatever. But I, I think that there's a there's a fundamental difference in this country of, of people who are helpers and people who are not helpers. Yeah. And I'm I'm a helper. I'm a fucking ally. And so 
I choose to look at the world that way. I was raised to look at the world that way. And so when I see people who are acting perpendicularly to that notion or people who are um, genuinely mean in opposition to things that I hold dear, like allyship and, and inclusion, then I not only disagree with them, but I don't even want to give them a platform. So, yeah, you know, and, and that's that's maybe a shortcoming of my own. But it's also like if if I'm if I'm trying to if I'm trying to create a bigger tent and somebody else is trying to create a smaller tent, um, we might agree on some things. We probably won't agree on everything. But where you have you have space in my tent, man, yeah. like you've got space, whereas in your tent, like maybe this friend of mine or maybe it doesn't have space, you know, yeah. for for where... a, a, an atheist like myself. For whatever the dividing issue is at sure. the moment, you know what I mean. Can I ask, yeah. like, because I was trying to think, where would, where does this come up in my life? And lately, nowhere. Uh, maybe a few. Maybe like when Trump, like the Trump Clinton election, there was like a few actual real life conversations that I had. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, where's this happening? Where you're. Ex coming across people that are the polar opposite is it just online like on social media or or is this happening in real life well my real life interactions are still you know somewhat limited you know since last time we spoke i had a baby so congratulations I, thank you very much he just turned one his name is thaddeus he's awesome shout out thaddeus it's past your bedtime go to bed <laughs> um <laughs> um but i you know i live in i live in a a tiny blue dot in a very red area in Lancaster, okay. Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, I, uh, it, it does not take me, uh, it doesn't, I don't have to look hard to find, uh, political science for, for Trump and Trump's minions. And, uh, that tells me all I need to know about those people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I've, this is what I've, like, this is what I've kind of like come up with though, is, is not to, not to, not to say that there's not a lot of dumb Trumpies. There are. But I feel like anybody could be a Trumpy because it's what they were exposed to, whether it was when they were young or recently with media. They're watching Fox News or whatever. You're watching MSNBC, maybe. I don't know. Uh, and so, like, you have a different worldview naturally because mm -hmm. of this propaganda that's happening. Now, back, back when... When it was just like four channels, you know, and there was no cable. Now we're we're talking a long time ago, right? Right. You know, everybody watched the Dukes of Hazard. Everybody watched Star Trek. Everybody watched, you know, some the same few shows, Mash, um, and and not to say that there wasn't propaganda because there probably there absolutely was propaganda back then, but it was just one propaganda. Now we have the two propagandas. Me being a moderate, right? I'm, of course, I'm saying this, <laughs> but <laughs> and, and I say I get sucked into both sides too. Like that's a good point. Oh, that's a good point. Or y'all are both stupid. You know, it happens. But, but, um, but I don't really think politically like I used to. Like I really, I I try, I try to think like like a father and like right. also just like an. Uh, I don't know. How do you think like an artist? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I mean, like, <laughs> let's let's just let's peel that back a little bit because I'm curious. And, and uh, you know, with like, oh, with all due respect, like, I, I mean, no offense by this, but just my perception of your band when I was young mm -hmm. and I was like a really angsty political punk. I'm still a political punk. I'm just not as angsty because um, I've learned how to manage that part of my personality a little bit better. But um like my perception of MXPX was that because you were known as a religious band, a Christian punk band, that you probably were more conservative. Right. And uh, certainly less progressive than me, you know, and and like the bad religion, anti-flag ilk of bands that um, that that I was, you know, ascribed to at that time and still am, quite frankly. But it would be an equal playing field because there was a mutual respect when I would go to Warp Tour and watch your band and then watch, you know, AFI next or whoever it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
it seemed like at a certain point that your band and the brand didn't want to necessarily disassociate with that notion, but you wanted to purposely kind of have it be a little bit ambiguous to be like, yeah, well, we're like, we're a pop punk band, dudes. Like everybody just calm down. Like we're good people. Hopefully you think we're a good band. And, and that was kind of like how you took off of, I would say from like slowly going the way of the Buffalo, like on, you know, but like everything before that seemed to be kind of tinged a little bit more with a little bit more Christian paint. Whereas after that, kind of demarcation of that record, which I think is probably your biggest record, maybe you can confirm or deny. But I, I think like at that point, maybe there was like a, a severance from that where it was purposely a little bit more ambiguous where you were just a, a rock band, a pop punk band that was writing great songs and having fun shows. Like, is is that fair to say, like in terms of timeline and and like point of view is just like a, a fan? Yeah, you're not wrong. You're you're pretty close. You're pretty you're pretty on. Um, I grew up going to church. Um, I went to youth group, you know, all through junior high, high school, and so it was just part of life. And yeah. that's what I knew about. And it was kind of like, okay, I could talk about this because I know about this, you know. And so started the band, released, poking at you, teenage politics. Um, those were the you know in high school still, and life in general was was written. <laughs> that's, after. that's incredible that you guys fucking did that in high school. That's <laughs> I know, yeah. it's weird. Credit to you guys. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it was just a, it was one influence, I and mean, we also the reason why I started the band was because I went and saw this, uh, became friends with this local band right down the street from my house, and I'd go watch their band practice. They were called Bad Juju one of the best punk rock bands in the area at the time sounded like bad religion-y um i mean with a different singer and different songs mm -hmm. you know or whatever but like yeah it was it was really like on that level and it was just like you can just do this you can just start a band in your in your garage and, and <laughs> yeah and so like combining the fact that i went to youth group and i got into punk rock locally um it just grew from there and, and like yeah and it's a natural paired. extension of your lifestyle yeah at that point and the, as such a young person as yeah, you were yeah. yeah and as i grew up i just kind of like most people or a lot of people do they'll they'll grow away from the church uh as they get older and a lot mm -hmm. of them you know when they get in their 40s they come back i've noticed because a lot of people that, I, that was were never religious now i'm friends with on facebook and they're like putting Bible verses up. We are like, dude, what are you talking about? You just were like at the bar, like, okay, all right. I mean, do your thing. I don't care. I mean, so many bands that you know that are Christian bands are like super heavy drinkers. Like I've been there too. Like when I was, especially with Tumble Down, I, I drank a lot, but like I'm not a heavy drinker anymore. I just drink a few here and there, but man, not to call, I don't want to call anybody out by name, but <laughs> they're all my friends. I love them. <laughs> But so many, so many, but yeah, I just grew, grew off it. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, like I said, I just tried to figure out where and what's mat what matters to me in my life right now and, and, and what will matter and try not to make harsh decision decisions. But, but I already, you know, never felt like gay people should be, you know, ostracized from the church you know it shouldn't be a thing mm -hmm. i think it i think it's it, it to each their own again you know if you want to right you want to walk around naked go for it just don't do it in front of my kids you know like just, <laughs> just that that kind of thing you know like there's private places where you can do your thing and and there's laws against sodomy in some states where you're, you're not even allowed to to do that in closed doors and it's just like that's ridiculous. Like what? It's so archaic and just as long as you know, as long as you've got the the okay between two people. <laughs> I think they I think they call that consent. Yeah. Yes, consent with then, a capital C. So yeah. I guess I'm in the consent party. It's like if you're good, if if you're good and I'm good, this should be legal. And and, and I get that there are you know, dangerous things like, like Tommy Rat, one, uh, our old tour manager always used to say, um, we'd go to Australia and there would be, there would be a, a, 
a stairway with no railing or something like that. He'd be like, this, you can never do this in America. But you know what this is? This is just, you know, it's, it's stupid tax. You know, it's like survival <laughs> of the fittest. If you're not smart enough to pay attention and not fall off the stairs and die, you can continue to live. And we don't do that in America. We, we make it really easy to live and to survive just barely. <laughs> just barely, yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! No, social Darwinism. I mean, that's a whole other. Uh, that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah, but, I know. but yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. My goodness. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, let's talk. We will. I want to talk about your album, Oblivion. For, wait, first of all, are can... you recording this? I just got to make sure. Are you recording it? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. Because I didn't see it on my thing, and I've definitely done full interviews and realized that I didn't record the whole thing. Oh, but... yeah. No, uh, I like it. so I just yeah. That's happened to me once, maybe twice in my life. It's it's happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> wait, actually, let me ask you a question before we jump into oblivion. Sure. I want to ask you. So, uh, my friend Dan in the UK who does punk vinyl underscore UK, I think is his Instagram handle. Does these tournaments for records for bands, and MXPX was just featured, and Life in General took the gold, and. So they're going away. The Buffalo took the the silver. I can't, I can't remember what came in third. Um, did you see that? And do you agree with it? Did you even notice that was going I on? I saw that was going on. I didn't pay attention to the end, or really, okay. I didn't look at it. I guess is what I mean. What I mean. Yeah, Let because me see I don't I could... personally. It's not for me. It's for the fans. You know. Uh, yeah, that's such a that's such a diplomatic answer though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I, I was going to choose... I need to make a declarative statement. Yeah, so you Life in General was first, slowly going away, the <laughs> Buffalo was second, and third was uh, Ever Passing Moment. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. I think self-titled should be up there, and it will be up there in a few years. But it needs okay. more time. You need more time for the for the newer, right. newer stuff to seep in. But it gets into your psyche after a while. That's what mm -hmm. happens. But also, you know, life in general, you know, for, for a lot of the, the hardcore longtime fans, you can't, you can't, there's just no other way to make those memories and to, to, to like imprint songs on, on you than living your teenage years and going sure. to scene shows and going to punk, you know, punk shows and, and getting a girlfriend or a boyfriend for the first time and playing those records, you know, so like you can get a record nowadays that's means a lot to you now and it's like but it's gonna mean a different a lot to you yeah the time yeah. and place has so much influence weighs so heavily on that which is why i love how dan has been doing this with these tournaments because i really the older i get the more i try to give the due respect to bands that continue to release new music and like take green day for example like I, I really do celebrate their whole catalog. It'd be easy for me to say Dookie is their best record or my favorite record, but when push comes to shove, like it it's not. And it's like low down on the list. It's maybe like ninth or tenth of the thirteen or fourteen that they have. Just because I, I But it's my favorite record. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's Let's... like I go out of my way to actively listen to new bands records because I it's easy to passively listen to them, especially in the Spotify age mm -hmm. where you don't have to commit to it financially or with uh, the time commitment of sitting down and looking through the liner notes, you know, like we all used to do when we were younger. And so it, it's like I, I think of, you know, uh, uh secret weapon or like the renaissance ep that you guys did like those things stick out to me not necessarily because of time and place that wasn't working against it but because like i made a conscious effort to actively listen to them and participate in the listening experience more so than just like oh well, it's, a, it's a new ep or it's a new thing on fat like whatever you know and so i that's why i love seeing these uh these tournaments that Dan has been doing and you're the first person that I've ever asked, uh, you know, what they thought about the results. So thank you for, for letting me uh, inquire. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. That stuff, you know, it's, 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 it's Tom Tuchilla, our uh, business partner. He, uh, he always tells me, don't read the comments. Don't, don't, you know, take suggestions, do this, do that. I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, okay. So, like, definitely don't comment. Like, so. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah. Oh. No, all the comments were positive in case you or Tom were curious. Yeah. It, oh, it's no, all, no, no, no. It's all just like friendly every, discussion. Anything, yeah. though. I mean, he's just saying anything. I'm like, okay. Oh, general? Yeah, yeah. That's that's good. Yeah. I comment on my own personal posts sometimes. Like I'll, like, I'll answer questions on those things. But like on the MXPX group or, you know, wherever you are, it's, yeah, it's meant for – He's telling me it's meant for fans. It's meant for the community. And yes, they would like you to be there, but it almost is distracting when you are, you know, mm -hmm. because they just want to give their opinions, spat out, oh, I hate this song, or I love this song, or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think the reason why he says don't read the comments is because he doesn't want me to go, oh, man, they don't like that album, what? Uh? Like this or that, like who cares? Like, <laughs> that doesn't matter if they like the album or not, right? It's, yeah. it's keep doing what you're doing, keep writing songs, keep putting out material, keep doing things that people will be happy that you do. And yeah, maybe every once in a while somebody doesn't like something. That's that's fine. That's not mm -hmm. for me to decide. And so once you let it go, it's for the people to talk about amongst themselves and not me, you know? Mm -hmm. But I... I I can't deny that it is not fun to read comments when you put up a new song and, and see how people are liking it or or even not liking it, whatever, right? But it's usually, yeah. yes, this is awesome, blah, blah, blah. So, And all, all band fans do that, not just MXPX. Obviously, you know, you get you get people on your new stuff. Oh, this is amazing, you know, with the, uh, what do they call the hands, the... Oh, the clapping. The praise like the, hands? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's what it is. Is yeah. it praise hands? Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I am I am the most illiterate emoji person <laughs> ever. Some people just do everything with emojis, uh, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I know. I I don't know what any of them mean. Like well, I thought the you know one what with the eggplant the, the smile I know what an eggplant is. Oh, yeah, okay. So I, you just lied. But I was then. late to that, Mike. I didn't I didn't know that for a long time. And I really like eggplant as a vegetable to eat. I enjoy uh, eggplant parmesan, baba ganoush, I, I, all these things. And I didn't, uh, I didn't know what that was. But uh, for the longest time, I thought this, the face with the tears was like emotional sobbing, sad crying. But it's laughter crying. Laughter crying. So yeah. I misused that that emoji for. Uh, oh. <laughs> probably about five years. Five years. <laughs> five six years. <laughs> My grandpa just died. Oh no! Happy. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Happy crying. <laughs> Thinking of all the good times. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah. somebody <laughs> predicted that, like, by tw you know, 2030, we'll all be speaking in just emojis. I don't think that's going to happen. But cursive has already become kind of not a thing. Like, not all kids learn cursive in school mm -hmm. these days so i mean we're, we're losing some of our our uh communication but it's kind of is it the same as like okay well we don't write everything down on parchment paper anymore either so whatever i can't speak to the cultural slip of that but my memory is not as good as it was i my short-term memory is not as good as it was because of the Access. Instant, the access yeah. and the the instantaneous responses, specifically with texts. Um, I, I'm going out of my way to have more phone calls with people just for the purpose of remembering what the hell the conversation was about. Because if it's in a text thread and I have to kind of go back through it and I need to reorientate myself, to me that's that's lost time and it's almost like a recommitment to a, a previous commitment to memory. And and I find that to be. Um, not worth the time. <laughs> if it's important, if it's really important, it's it deserves a, a phone call or a full email. I agree. But, phone call. But I mean, if texting it's really is texting for important stuff is is kind of I'm I'm over it, man. I'm Super over it. Super weird. I mean, I yeah. like texting because I don't want to talk to everybody. But if it's like, if we need to get something done, it's got to be a call. Right. Yeah. If it's nonsense or jokes or, or BS or, or what have you, or it's a simple yes or no, but if it's for the purpose of discussion, no way, man. Yeah. Can't, can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. I'd rather, I'd rather hand write a cursive letter to somebody than uh, text a soliloquy about 
the nuances of whatever issue it is that we're trying to fix or what so, have you. So that that reminds me of a good question I had. Well, I don't know if it's a good question. It's a question I have. <laughs> you know, what are the difference? How do you song write songs now versus like the first time you wrote a song? Because I imagine that that process is slightly different. And if it's not, I'm fascinated to know that as well and why. Ye well, I mean, the main thing is thankfully... I'm better at it now than when I first started writing songs. So what are your tactics though? Like, Oh yeah. The first, I say that because the first thing that comes to mind is when I first started writing songs, if I wrote something that melodically made sense and I could feel it, then I would use it. Now I will get to that point, but then I'll pressure test the hell out of it to make sure that it, you know, what's the best key that it works in or, and then, and then I might actually end up eventually scrapping it because it doesn't, it doesn't have the gravitas or, or it doesn't feel as good as some of the other songs I've written. Um, but I'm, it's funny you ask that I'm in the process of starting to change how I write songs before I would come up with a guitar riff or a chord progression and then a melody. Occasionally I'd have like these like Jedi moments where like I would hear a word or a phrase and I could write all the lyrics like mm -hmm. without lifting my pen off the paper and I could like hear it and, and, and see it. And it would just kind of literally like come out of my mind onto the pen and I could write down chords and, and have everything. I had a song on a, an older record of mine. The song was called Melissa Militia. And it was this, you know, love that got away song or whatever. But I, I literally wrote that in like five minutes. Just, it just came naturally to me. And so when that happens, I, I, I try to see if I can find a few more songs that can happen with such uh, ease. Normally it doesn't happen. But like I said, primarily and for the most part in my career, I'd start with a riff or a chord progression and then develop melodies from there. Now I'm actively trying to start with melodies first and craft around them because I'm recognizing that the strong, the songs of mine on Oblivion and the songs of mine on my previous record, Cold War, that I feel are the strongest are because they have the most memorable melodies. Mm. And I can't believe it took me until my fourth record to figure that out. But thankfully I did that in the uh, the process of writing the songs for oblivion even if i wasn't doing it consciously i found that's that shift kind of happened during the the crafting of the songs for that record uh but moving forward now like i'm i'm looking above my monitor here i have a list of 15 songs that are in some you know in some form they're in the mm -hmm. process of being crafted and the ones that i keep looking at and thinking oh man i gotta get back to blue or i gotta get back to to stranger or whatever these songs are going to be called the ones that i have trouble coming back to are the ones that i can't find a melodic hook for but the chord progressions are great but i'm leaving them aside so for now like 2020 on that version of jeff berman as a songwriter is focused primarily on melodies and letting everything else come afterwards that's smart yeah, it are more iterations, right? You just do, you just try it more times. Like, that's something that I didn't do probably when I first started writing was going over the core. Like, once you come up with the chorus, just going over it over and over. I think Diane Warren, she's a pretty famous songwriter. Mm -hmm. And she was, I was listening to like a snippet of an interview and she was talking about that. She was like, I go over it over and over and I just sing that part. And until I, one, until I know it perfectly and, and also it, it flows really nicely. And if it doesn't, then I got to change something, you know, and that's, I, th you know, it's kind of like, I was cool to hear somebody that's obviously successful, you know, a great songwriter do what I was trying, what I, I was trying to do that. And I was like, okay, now I know that I should just do it more. And so I just started mm -hmm. doing it even more, um, and I'll do that with, you know, verse parts too and, and whatever. Like most of the time I'll come up with a verse, like the, the very beginning of the song is what, what I usually come up with, um, which is probably what most people do as well, but just because it's the beginning. But um, you're saying you might start with like the biggest hook of the song, like the chorus or the, the beginning of the chorus or 
Now I'm trying to. Trying and to do that. What you just said made me think of something. I, I have some songs of mine that I really, really like. One of them is called Home for the Summer. One of them is called 1983. One of them is called The Daughters and the Sons. And these were pillars for Cold War, our previous record. They The songs that we play at every show, and um, they were the staples from that record that we built the rest of the record around. I started writing all of the songs from the intro and then building it out. And with all three of those songs, I really struggled with defining what the lyrics and what the melody should be for the choruses. Mm -hmm. The verses came to me right away, and I struggled for the better part of nine or ten months to really, really nail this. And I sometimes I look through this hard drive looking for old stuff or what have you, and I see this just graveyard of <laughs> of, uh, of voice note ideas and garage band ideas of me just trying anything and everything I could to write the hook for these, almost to the point where I, I think I tried too hard and and stifled my progress and my creativity, which I know that's something that I'm sure you've dealt with at times where it's like you, you're banging your head against the wall, especially if you're in the studio and you're just, you have to walk away. And sometimes you have to walk away for a month or two or whatever. I think I stand by all three of those songs, but I think that all three of them have too many words, too many syllables, too many beats that I need to hit in the vocal delivery of the choruses. That said, all these years later, or you know, three and a half years later, I still don't know what I would change, you know, if I had to rewrite the songs. Mm -hmm. So I think I just kind of worked myself into a pickle with them that was, uh, I, I use this, you know, sparingly, but somewhat traumatic. In a, in a rather frustrating moment in my career where we were trying to get this record done and to do it to tape, you know, so it's like you also don't want to, if you're recording a record to tape, you don't want to do a million vocal takes. You want to do like five maximum because then the tape could be compromised if you do too many or whatever. I don't know. So it it was a challenge. And one of the reasons why I'm so in love with our new record, Oblivion, is because I didn't have that same frustration. The melodies just came to me. Even if the choruses, uh, for example, the opening track on Oblivion is a song called Monuments. The chorus has a lot of words, but it it flows. like It, mm -hmm. it feels natural. It doesn't feel forced. Sometimes I listen to 1983 or Home for the Summer, and I think I, 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 I got the gravitas and the energy in the vocal performances in those choruses. But there's a little much in there, you know. There's there's may, maybe a little too much, and uh, I, I try not to go too public with this sort of insider thinking because I, I don't want to cloud anybody's any fans' judgment of the song. If they love the song for what it says in that moment, I don't want to poo-poo on that moment. You know what I mean? Um, but it, it it was definitely enough of a the songwriting uh, frustrating period of time that. I, I guess I used it as, you know, inspiration to n not get myself into a similar situation with the songs on Oblivion and really let the the melody and the hooks, the the vocal hooks specifically, uh, come to me mm. in a more natural way. Yeah, I mean, uh, you did it. I mean, sometimes you just got to walk away, take a break, let it percolate. I always say percolate because that's how <laughs> that's how I do my my song ideas. I'll come up with the the hook or the line or whatever it is that that'll inform the rest i'll come up with a bunch of starters so i have in my in my memo my mm -hmm. phone memos i have starters um and then i've got i've got all these different folders but starters boom just tons of them and then i i grab like once i grab an idea i'll grab that and put it into its own folder and rename and name a new folder whatever that song's gonna be but um that really like makes it so i can like take an idea figure out a part for it maybe it's like a there's a song or whatever you know it's like that's how i start writing a song and so sometimes it is the chorus, sometimes it's the very beginning, but 
if I'm like sitting down to something got really loud. I don't know if it's my mic cable. Sorry. Oh, it, it didn't come through the headphones on my end. It's on my recorder. I've just had to bang it like the old TV trick. <laughs> uh, it was like, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they couldn't handle my song. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how yeah that's pretty much how i start a song is like i'll just go through my ideas uh-huh sometimes i'll start a song without the idea and i'll just start recording and just and that's when it usually starts from the very beginning like okay here's the intro and then here's the the verse and then i usually don't have a chorus or anything but yeah yeah another thing i did this time around is i i got a lockout space in los angeles when i was still living there mm. and you know, just the simple fact that I had to pay rent on this place, obviously, made me that much more motivated to go there every day off that I had. And even if it was just for two hours, it, it I treated it like a job and it was I was getting things done. And there was this nasty, just disgusting, grime covered, out of tune piano at that place that when I was like tired of, of looking at my laptop or, or, you know, messing with the PA or whatever I was doing, just kind of demoing these ideas out loud, I would just go sit at the piano and then I would bring with me the hooks that were kind of in my head. And that really helped bring them to life in terms of simplicity and execution. I can't play a song on piano really just to save my life, but I have grown to become pretty good at mapping out melodic structure on a piano mm -hmm. in a form that helps me translate it back to whether it's something on guitar or whether it's something on, uh, you know, in, in a vocal delivery. And that, that really, really helped me on, on this. And it was almost like, I, man, I wish I would have known this, you know, for the past three records before this, because I think it would have been quite beneficial that's cool. So are you going to get a, a grimy old piano in, at your house or what? I have one. I have a, a grimy, well, it's mostly clean, um, <laughs> but it's because so Thaddeus plays on it. He likes to kind of just jump around on it, but it's it's really, really nice and it's it's really helpful just to, again, it to me, it's a reprieve when, you, when you're looking at a computer all day just to sit at a piano without a computer. Mm -hmm. And it's different. Like, you know, I have a, a MIDI keyboard sure. behind me. It doesn't feel the same, man. It it's doesn't not. feel the same. It doesn't bring out of me. My my ears and my my love for music don't resonate as much if I'm listening to myself play, a, a, you know, a Moog, style, a Moog style synth, you know, in, in, my, uh, in my headphones. But if it's just a, a regular piano and it's simplistic and beautiful by its own right, then... Yeah. I, I hear the melodies with which much, with much more clarity, and uh, I think it helps with the execution of it. Yeah, I agree. I, I like yeah. real stuff. I had a piano in here at one point. Not anymore. Um, I've got a, an organ over there, Hammond C3, not a B3. The C3 is the same sound as a B3, but it's slightly bigger. So the B3 is for band. So you can haul that thing. It's so, yeah, so huge yeah. still. But then the C3 is for church. So it's a church one. It's actually, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah. There in the corner. Yeah, that's great. Beyond. There it is. So, yeah, that's, you know, that's all hooked up, ready to be turned on. And uh, I've got the Leslie. And so now and again, I'll just turn it on. And, and I love it when somebody comes by that actually can play because I can't really play the organ very well. I can't play even the piano very well. I know chords, and I'm rusty right now. So, but, but um, when I get somebody on that thing, it just sounds so good. I mean, it's it starts twirling around and <laughs> love it. Yeah, man. There's there's nothing like it. There's nothing <laughs> like it. Oh my goodness. I, I think the the last time that we talked, I had just released a single called "Baby in the Band." Okay. Yeah. 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 And that, that that song is on Oblivion as well, and it's a it is the most delicate song I've I've ever released. And it, I mean, it has a falsetto solo in in the song, and it has a guitar solo in the song, which is you know, whatever. That's I can do that, but it has a little 
dainty piano solo in the song. And I think that really exemplifies like there's not much to it. It almost sounds like I'm kind of breaking up a scale. But in that moment of the song, those little itty bitty, super compressed, heavily reverb and delayed piano notes. I mean, it's one of my favorite parts of the whole record. It it really makes it shine in a different way that than like anything else, you know, mm. on the record does. And I'm glad that I was, I don't know. It's like, I don't want to break my back by patting myself on, on the back too hard, but I'm glad that I allowed myself the, uh, the freedom to explore those kinds of ideas on this record, because I feel like it made for a richer tapestry of, of Sonic, you know, across 10 songs than I would have otherwise achieved. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, you sent it. I got it. Uh, finally. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Let's see, Very cool artwork. Um, Shout out to Doug Dean in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who does great artwork. Yep, yep, Baby in the Band, right there in the middle, song number five. It's the deep cut. It's the end of side A, yeah. That's always where the best song is, usually. Well, it's like, you know, the first first half, but you got to end on a, on a really good song so that people will actually want to turn it over and listen to the next side, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I, I I forgot to mention when you turn it over, the first song on side B is a song called Reckoning. That it, first of all, it features Jen Pop from the Bond Pops uh, on guest vocals, and and she really helped add some some very important gravitas and weight to the song. This kind of brings the conversation full circle because the song was about the Brett Kavanaugh hearings uh, when he was being, uh, you know, uh, the the what's it called the the hearings when he's you know being questioned by the the senate yeah, and the whatever senate and they hearings. were talking about this and there and dr blasey confirmation Ford, yeah yes yes and she was um uh you know this woman had uh, accused him of sexual assault all these years ago and she was telling her story and the way in which her story was uh disregarded and also simultaneously made the country really uncomfortable because of how compelling and and true it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I put that into a song and with with Gen Pop, but I play piano on that song. I will be the first to admit oh, nice. I don't play piano on that song very well, but it worked to my advantage. It was a song I did in Belgium, and uh, with with Tim Van Dorn and and the piano that he had was kind of this jangly thing, and we just threw a bunch of effects on it to make it sound like I was not totally incompetent in piano, but it was meant to be, you know, like a jarring contrast to anything else on the record, like this yeah. big, bold piano. And then we coupled it with kind of like a noise solo and coupled it with some, some really kind of vibey out there, 80s synths, you know? Um, and the vocals <laughs> kind of have this ethereal sound to them. Yes. And then yeah. when Jen joins me on the choruses, it's just it blooms and to be that much uh, greater. And, uh, you know, because I, I didn't want to write a song about something that I thought was that not I thought that's something that is a serious thing. And, and uh, I didn't want to sing about sexual assault and have it be delivered in a manner that was like t perceived as tongue in cheek or tactless. Like I, I needed it to have instrumentation that matched the severity of the moments of what those songs are, are uh, is about and uh despite my very very um novice piano playing i, I think we achieved it with that that's awesome yeah. so uh what are you doing with the record how are you how are you promoting this thing how are you it's pretty new it's just came out this year yeah, it came out in February. We just got the vinyl in hand a few weeks ago. Um, I mean, right now I'm looking to the fall and looking to do some shows uh, in Europe and some shows probably on the East Coast, but not a whole lot in terms of touring. You know, my my life is a, a little bit different now. I've got a, a family and uh, a house, and so my responsibilities are different, but also I, I kind of want to chase different ideas than I did before. You know, I, I know that the times that you and I have crossed paths on the road um, or at Warped Tours or the acoustic stages at places, like, I, you know, from 2012 to 
the end of 2019, I toured really hard and was doing around 100 shows a year and booking that all myself and, and doing that all myself. And um, there was one year where I, you know, played 150, another year where I played 171 shows or something in 2014. And by the end of 2019, I kind of burned myself out and having no, you know, uh, foreboding that there was going to be a pandemic that was going to wreak havoc on the world. I did make a decision to not tour as much. And I did make a decision to focus on writing and really making this next record better, different, more interesting than my previous three. And so right now I'm still kind of riding a wave of I achieved what I set out to achieve and I'll kind of tackle what's next in the fall. I, I, it's kind of a diplomatic answer to, to a very simple question, but no, I, I don't know. I, I can't get myself to commit to like touring this summer yet. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm still kind of figuring it out. Like this dad thing is, is really cool, but it's, man, it's, it's a trip. Like yeah. it requires a lot of attention and responsibility and, uh, I, I would yeah. say I would say based on just the fact that everything's kind of chaotic right now in the world, but also in the music business and touring, shows are not all going that great, you know, for mm -hmm. people. Um, people are still getting COVID for that matter. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's like, what? I forgot about COVID. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, like, that's not a thing still, is it? So, I mean, that's still happening too. So, I mean... When you have a young kid, don't feel bad about staying home. Stay home as much as you possibly can. Yeah, work work yeah. on stuff at home, but you can never get those years back, those those formative years. And and it's been great. I mean, I, even with the schedule that MXPX had in twenty well twenty eighteen around those four years, like twenty twenty fourteen to twenty nineteen, I guess it would be. But uh, it was doing a lot of weekends and I was doing weekends with Goldfinger as well and I was doing mm -hmm. solo dates and it was just like I was gone almost too much and I wasn't even touring I mean I wasn't I, I did a few tours actually now that I think about it I did right I did a few European tours you can't really just like do a weekend in Europe you, you got a tour <laughs> so those end up being tours but uh yeah Australia tours Japan all that yeah, but even limiting it a bit it's still like it was like still too much. So to be honest, like the COVID thing was really same. We were the same. We were kind of getting burnt out on, on stuff and, and um, doing the shows here, the live streams that we did here in the studio were a lot of work, but I could still be home with the kids and yeah. people still got to experience something. So it was cool. You know, you just find creative ways to do whatever you got to do. And I think, I think uh, it doesn't always have to be out on the road. Yeah, yeah. I I got a text message from my friend Scott Manley, someone I've known, you know, since I was a really, really little kid. And it, I think it was my favorite compliment about uh, Oblivion, about the new record, where he, he was, he said something about, like, like the sonic, like, the soundscapes that you achieved are, like, really quite phenomenal. Like, it's very vast and different. And that really made me feel good because... If I would not have stopped touring as much or if COVID would not have happened, I think this time period, I probably would have just done a record in an expedited fashion to the point where it probably would have been kind of flat. Like, you know, it would have just been like a, a basic representation of like what a live show would be. Not to say that that's bad or that there certainly isn't a segment of my audience that would like that sort of bring a divided heaven back to the campfire sort of vibe. But, you know, I, I'm glad that I was able to achieve something sonically that was, you know, I, I envisioned and I was able to work with good producers that helped me bring that to, to life and to fruition. Because if something were to happen, I mean, knock on wood, and I was never able to tour again, but I was still able to do music, that's what I want. You know, I, I want people to listen to Divided Heaven Records and be like, man, this is great. These are great lyrics. This is great vocals. Everything sounds really good. Because 
you know, I, I think those are the strengths that I have that kind of set me apart from a lot of my peers. Not that they don't have great vocals or great sounding records, right? But I think mine sound different than most of the songwriters that are kind of in my ecosystem or cadre sure. of, of fellow, you know, singer songwriters. And, uh, you know, if it, I'd like to do this for a long time. So as I'm focused on longevity, I want to be able to look back at the art that I've actually, if, if I, if I put a cap on the number of experiences that I've had in terms of touring and everything, I want to be able to look back at the art that I've created and the records that I've made and, still be amazed at how they sound 30 or 40 years from now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, the, the pandemic certainly has played a role. Becoming a father has, has played a role in all of the decisions for how I pursue divided heaven going forward. But it's, it's not like it's a negative deterrent, those things, you know, I look at it as a, as a, as a, a way for me to positively continue to explore new sonic and songwriting terrain yeah um that just, will that will impress people you yeah, know you're just taking advantage yeah. of your situation so you can tour more when the kid grows up a bit you know or you know and the pandemic has yeah. passed and all these things it's like it's not it's not that touring isn't great but it's like it's okay to like take a, a chill and do do some home stuff work yeah. on stuff at home make that make those soundscapes you know create that new that new sort of workflow of how you're putting together your new stuff, you know? And exactly. If you're just working on, Oh, we have a show coming up in a couple months, then that's all you're going to have, you know, or a tour coming up or whatever it is, you know, you're just going to be working on that. So, yeah. And just having the record out now, I mean, I, I'm very grateful that I've got like a, I'll be small, but dedicated fan base of people who like waited until like I had the records and like sent out the emails that, you know, as opposed to, I mean, we sold, you know, through the labels for the pre-orders and stuff, both in Europe and in the States. But, you know, there's a lot of people that have ordered the record for me, and I'm very, very grateful for that. But just being back in that frame of mind of doing Divided Heaven administrative stuff, I was like, man, I did not miss this at all. I just like writing songs and creating and coming up with cool sounds and, and, uh, and doing this. But, yeah, like, you know, the logistics and you know the managerial stuff that you yeah. have to do the administrative stuff that you have to do when you're an artist especially when you're kind of more or less a one-man band can be really taxing Absolutely. and so i've i've enjoyed not having to do that but i i am very grateful that people are, are ordering the record and i hope more people continue to order the records because i i do like doing mail order but it's obviously not as fun as crafting songs you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's not so bad i do it myself um Anything you want to leave people with uh, before we wrap up, Jeff? Yeah, please. If you're a vinyl or CD person, I'd love to send you a, a vinyl record or a CD of the new record, Oblivion. If you're the streaming type, more power to you. You can find the new Divided Heaven record, Oblivion, across all streaming platforms. And, uh, you know, if you see me on social media, give a follow or a like or a thumbs up or just send a message and say, hey, I, I heard you on Mike's podcast again. And uh, I disagreed with everything you said, and I hate you. And, you know, no. I'm <laughs> but no, but I do. I got to thank you, Mike. Honestly, the, the last time I was on your show, I heard from so many people that I had not heard from in a while. And it was a really good reintroduction to them of Divided Heaven and kind of what I've been up to, you Excellent. know, because – yeah, it, people forget or they move on or, you know, it's it's not in, in front of them or maybe they knew I did it, but they didn't follow me or whatever. Um, but it, it did that and it reconnected me with people. Uh, it connected me with new people here in my hometown of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Great. So that was that was cool. So I, I appreciate it very much. Yeah, man. Thanks for being on. I appreciate it. Dude, thank you very much. All right, everybody. Thank you. Jeff Berman, Divided Heaven. Go check out the album Ob Oblivion. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Um, we'll talk again. Dude, thank you so much, man. I, I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Cheers. All right. See you, Mike. Cheers.